Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you for coming to this talk. Thank you for finding your way to this talk, which wasn't uh, uh, hasn't been all that easy, as you probably as you probably know, it's not been um, not quite made it into the uh, into the DevOps system yet. And the reason for that is because uh, it was a pre it's a kind of late a late addition to the program. Um, Mark just said to me uh, last week, "Did I have a talk to give?" And uh, I said, "Well, I could work this thing up, which I was actually intending to do sometime much later." And so, uh, and so it, I've had a, a few sleepless nights with it, and you'll forgive any rough edges, I hope, <coughs> like quite a lot of them. So if you get a chance to, uh, to give feedback, um, please do. If, I think you have to do it through the app, and the app is quite often not showing, not showing this talk. So if you don't get a chance to give the feedback, well, I, I might actually be quite pleased about that. So, um, so I'm going to talk about my front door, uh, because I, I kind of really... I'm very happy about the place I live in, for the, for the most part. I'm going to give you a brief uh, introduction to that. Um, oh, I'm going to talk about, give the statutory introduction to myself first. Um, so uh, this, is, this is me. I'll have to turn this on. Um, so this is, this is me, and I do these things, which means I don't have a proper job, and I'm these things, a Java champion and a Java one rock star, which seems to be going quite well. And I've written a couple of books on Java, and the, the main thing that you can get out of this is I am really, really not a hardware guy. I really don't know anything about hardware. So this talk is aimed, if, if you were in the last talk, uh, where, where we saw Raspberry Pis doing absolutely amazing things with trains, then you're not going to be very impressed with this one, I'm afraid, because I don't do anything very amazing at all. Uh, I, I, in, order to, in order to do this little project that I'm, that I'm going to talk about here, I needed to know something about hardware, which I didn't know very much about, and also about um, private branch exchanges. Uh, and about voice over IP, uh, about Groovy, which I'm not, uh, which I was almost completely unfamiliar with, about how to do voice recognition, and quite a lot about quite a lot about Unix. And as somebody who's really, really not very expert about any of these at all, the best I can tell you is I've managed to get this thing to work. And so I want to just tell you to be encouraged. If you don't know anything, if you're you, as, as ignorant as I. What I was going to say was, but still am, because I've learned exactly as much as I needed to know about each of these things, then you too can control your front door. <laughs> uh, th this is the, I've, I've been around for so long, this, I thought, for once I will show this slide, which is the first computer I ever used, uh, I won't say programmed. Um, it had, um, well, we can, just, we can just stop at this point, it had uh, 4,000, 4K, uh, 20, I can't remember the word length, 16 or 18 bits, 4, 4K 16-bit words. And uh, you could do quite a lot with it, actually. It was, uh, it was attached to an instrument, um, the very early um, magnetic resonance imaging um, uh, spectrometer, which I, which, I, which I was working with, and it had a game on it, the first computer game I ever played. You could shoot ducks. I remember it distinctly because you had to stay up all night. All nighters are not a new thing for me. You had to stay up all night because the machines were, the machines were so slow to take the spectra. And in, and in the small hours of the morning, you could uh, shoot ducks on this Varian 620i. Forty years later, um, uh, 40 plus years later, uh, Java won last year. Oracle made a present to me of, a, of this um, Raspberry Pi, which gathered dust on my shelf for quite a long time. I, I, was, I, was, kind of I was pleased to get it, but like, what am I going to do with it? And uh, so eventually the idea, the idea kind of gradually grew on me because I have too much time on my hands in the winter to try and do something about a problem I have. So this is, this is, a, this is a street I live on. And you can see there's a mountain at the end of it. This is Edinburgh. And there's a mountain at the end, which is called Arthur's Seat. Those are, that's the, the Hollywood Crags. Um, no, that's not the name. Um, Salisbury Crags. And I live in this house there on the right. This is the view. Uh, from Arthur's seat down onto um, down onto the uh, on, onto that terrace, it was, the the terrace is really nice. It's a Georgian terrace. It was built in the 1780s. It was the first uh, Georgian architecture in Edinburgh. In fact, was here and on George Square just next to it. Uh, and the university now owns very nearly all of it. So everybody thinks that university the university actually owns all of these these built these first buildings, and they've got almost all of the, al almost all of the second ones. <coughs> this is the house. I, this this is the the tenement I live in. That's 
that's my, that's my windows there. And this is my front door, my famous front door. And as you can see, it's, it is really famous because Francis Jeffrey lived here from uh, 1801 to 1802 and founded the Edinburgh Review. And if you know anything about Scottish history, that's a big deal. And if you don't, well, it obviously isn't. Uh, but what you do get out of this is that uh, there's lots of university flats in here. You can't quite make it out. The resolution isn't very good on this, but there's lots of university flats in there. And this is great because what it means is that at evenings and weekends, it's just offices, everybody goes home and I have the place pretty much to myself. There's one other flat on the whole staircase, which, uh, which my son lives in, actually. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's, really, it's really great. I can make as much noise as I want, and they don't make any noise at all. There's only one problem. So um, here is the illustration of the, of, of the problem. Here comes an Amazon delivery. Oh, I need, I need to turn the sound on. And there's nobody in when, when, when Amazon comes to visit. Did you get the sound off that at all? You did get the sound, cool. Um, well, you're nodding at the front, but <laughs> you got the speaker. Did, did the sound come over the speakers at all? Good. Um, and I need to know that because there's going to be a little bit more sound. I forgot where the microphone was. So what am I going to do about this? Well, the entry phone system, which wasn't built in the 1780s like the flat, but as you can see, wasn't built much later, <laughs> works like this. Uh, I mean, it, it's not something you'd normally think about. Well, obviously, obviously, somebody presses the buzzer there, and then they speak into this, and up, upstairs in the flat, here's the, here's, here's the entry phone in, in, in the flat, and, uh, and I, hear them, I hear them talking, and then I press this switch, and that operates this solenoid, and that opens the front door. Very good. And this works actually quite well, but it only works, if, obviously, if there's, somebody, if there's somebody in. <clears throat> Uh, behind, if you take the front off the entry phone system, well, you see this, I mean, obviously there's bits of, it, bits of wiring in there. And it didn't occur to me for a long time that you might actually do something about this. So what you could do about it is actually just try and take a look and see what, the, what that switch does when you press it down. And it doesn't do anything very complicated. It just shorts out these two contacts. And there's obviously a voltage supply somewhere, and I don't even know where. And that powers the solenoid, and that opens the door. So, so the question about where's the connection between a Raspberry Pi and my front door is, is that that's the connection. I, what I need to do, oh, those have come out solid. That what I need to do is somehow short out those two contacts, get the Raspberry Pi to do that. So how, how to do this is actually not at all complicated. Um, if you know anything about Raspberry Pis, which I didn't, so, like, so I'm starting absolutely from scratch here. I'll, t I'll explain to you in a minute quite how, far, from, quite how uh, uh, far back I was starting. So, I, went, so I, I googled, of course, in the way that one does, and I discovered that actually it's really, really simple to do what I wanted to do. This is exactly the equivalent, or almost exactly the equivalent, of lighting an LED. Right? That's Pretty, it's pretty much the same. The difference is there's a bit more power coming through the, um, coming uh, to operate the solenoid, and you don't want to expose the Raspberry Pi's GPIO pins, these, these things here. You don't want to expose them to, the, to arbitrarily high voltages from the, um, uh, from the, 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 the entry phone circuit. But this thing here, which is, a, which is a, uh, a MOSFET, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, and which costs, I think, about three pounds if you buy the, the, um, the resistor and a little, little circuit board kit to go along with it, this thing uh, w will act as a relay. Right? And this, that's, this there is exactly, what I, is exactly what I did. And you can see it. There's, there's a picture of the thing that's down here on the desk. And I can't lift it up to show it to you because I put it together in such a fragile way that if I move it, the wires will fall out. So that's how, that's how much of a hardware guy I am. But that's, that's what we're going to have. Now, it, for the rest of this talk, this battery here and this buzzer here are going to represent my entry phone system. Because actually, the one thing that you just have to take it from me, or almost take it from me, that, um, that if I can get that buzzer to sound, then I can get my, then I can get my front door to open by, by shorting across the, the two contacts in the entry phone. So that's my fancy hardware setup, and that's the whole lot. That's the hardware part of the talk done. And believe me, it was that stretched me. It stretched me. So the next thing you've got to do is actually um, is get the is get the Pi to control it. 
this is this is an indication. I was going to, I was I was telling you I'm going to give you an indication of how far back I was with the Raspberry Pi when I started when I started off because I found that this um, uh, I, I managed to connect a screen and a keyboard to it, and I found a power supply which is one of these. Um, uh, b uh, you know, battery packs, which seemed to have the right voltage. And I plugged that in, and I was really surprised when nothing happened. I actually had to take it along to the local hobbyist, uh, the, the local hacker people, and they said, well, you know, you've got to, you've got to give it an operating system to work on. <laughs> so, I, so I went out and I bought a flashcard, and I put an operating system on it, and then things went up a bit better after that. So this is why, if, I, if you think I'm being a bit elementary with this, this is the reason why. I had to have it explained to me in words of one syllable. So you, you download uh, Raspbian, and, you, um, and then you do stuff that you're going to need to do this on, I, I guess probably, how many people have done this already? It's almost everybody, right, so I can go through it really quickly. So you, so you unmount the... Um, so you, un you unmount the flashcard, you put the flashcard into your machine, unmount it. I'm, I'm, I'm on a Mac, so I'm, that's, that's what I'm going to do. You, you, you DD, bit copy the image that you've downloaded onto, onto, the, um, on, onto the disk, uh, you eject it, um, you, you stick it into the Pi, and then you SSH to the Pi, and you, and you, and you configure the Pi. So really, it's pretty, it is really pretty straightforward, even for somebody who doesn't know anything very much about Unix. And here's the configuration, uh, window, uh, configuration tool for the Pi. And really, the only thing you've got to do is just uh, make sure that the internationalization is set up right, because you do want to get the time zone right for the Pi. It will set itself automatically if it's got an internet connection. So it's really all, all pretty good. So the next thing is, I, still, I, want to be able to, uh, I want to be able to control this thing, and I want to... And I don't want things to be more unfamiliar than they absolutely have to be, so I'm going to use Java, something, I, something at least that I do know a bit about. So I'm going to install pi for j and again, this is pretty straightforward because there's a Debian package for it. Raspbian is the Debian version, uh, uh, is the Debian operating system for the, for the Raspberry Pi, and again, the thing that I'm least unfamiliar with. Um, download, download pi for j um, update everything, in install it, and build, and build the examples. This is really important because the examples are actually quite good. I actually only need one example. There's, a, there's an example of a called controlgpio.java in, um, in, in Py4j, which will control, the, which will control the, the, the pins. It will actually, it does more, much more than I wanted. So I've edited it down and called it my gpio example. Java because I just wanted to use it for this. Really, I, all I need to do, all I need to do is just simply um, change the voltage on one pin once for, for, the, for this to work. But here, what I've done, just in order to, in order to demonstrate to you that I'm not completely making everything up uh, in, the, in this talk, I've, uh, I've, I've allowed it to accept different uh, repetition counts, so we, so we can do fancy things like making it buzz twice or three times. It's very exciting. Um, this stuff here is things that you, I mean, if you were going to know about the Raspberry Pi hardware, this, this would be stuff that you would need to know about. But basically, this is, the, this is the whole guts of the Java program that I've got driving it. So really, again, it's pretty, uh, it really is pretty straightforward. So just to prove that, uh, that I did actually, that this uh, sophisticated hardware really did work, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm actually going to run Oh, yep, good. Can you, uh, do I need a bigger font th than this? Uh, can, can you read it at the back? Say yes if you can read it. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. Okay, so I'm going to, um, am I logged into the, I'm logged into the Pi already here. Uh, I'm logged in as root, which is, which is actually pretty important because you can't do any of this stuff for the, you can't do, do any hardware things with the Pi unless you are, uh, unless you're super user. And I'm going to, I'm in the right place. I'm even in the right place. So I'm now going to uh, do the first demo of the, uh, of the day. Lib slash star. So I'm j basically, I'm just going to run my GPIO example. And at this point, I can actually you know, get some audience participation. How many buses would you like it to have? Two. Two. Right, OK. Two it is. Right. <laughs> I don't have a good reputation with, uh, with demos, you know. Okay, so um, 
Uh, right, so, so far so good, but it's not really very far because like, I can't really ask my delivery man to get into the flat and um, obviously uh, operate, you know, log into the Pi. And it would hardly re that would kind of, kind of uh, um, remove the point of the whole thing. So we, need, so we need something a bit more than that. Right. Um, what, and the question is, how is, the, how is my delivery man Going to, um, going to actually operate this thing, because it's going to be outside, obviously. So I did think about this a bit, and this is, the, this is maybe, maybe the hard part. The obvious thing would be to, would be to use a, a mobile app. That's what everybody would do. Right? But I don't really want this, because, of, because my delivery man isn't going to have a mobile app on his phone. And, or my delivery person, I should say, to be, correct, to be correct about these things, is not going to have a mobile app on their phone. And similarly, the same for accessing a web page. It's not really very usable. So the one thing that you do know a delivery person has is they definitely do have a phone. So, um, so I'm going to rely on that. And so what I could do, and this would probably be the easiest thing, the, easiest, the best compromise in terms of uh, ease for me and ease for them, would be to use uh, what DTMF, are they called? The, the tones on the code, to get them, to, get them to, um, uh, to press the buttons on the, co on, the, on the phone. But I thought that's a bit kind of, I don't know, I didn't seem like, uh, it, seemed, it seemed a bit um, old, old school to me. So I thought, why don't we just, why don't we go the whole hog and go for voice recognition? Uh, well, uh, my idea is I'm going to send Amazon, you know, when they ask for the special instructions about the delivery. And this will also do for the people I, I, I rent to via Airbnb. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to send them a code. And the idea of this code is that it's going to be, it's going to be uh, locked onto the, their phone number if it's a friend or obviously not if it's the Amazon delivery person. It'll have, in, it'll have a number of times it can be used, once for the Amazon delivery person, but maybe more for other people. And it'll have a, an expiration date as well, because you, you, know, you don't want your friends, you don't want the people who were your friends still to be able to get in. So, so that's, the, that's the theory. I mean, if I can get it to work at all, then I can, then I can, then I can actually manage those constraints. Um, so, so, so that's the plan. I haven't actually implemented any of that validation stuff. I've got, I've, I've got. A <laughs> well, I mean that stuff's kind of straightforward. It's an exercise to the reader because all you really need to do is just you, you just have a, a file with, um, with with those constraints recorded in it, and then you have an interface which will allow which will allow that, them to be uh, new numbers to be added. So, as I say, I did this talk in, th in, in, in a few days, so some stuff had to, had to drop out. So the question is, now, what, how are we going to do all this? This voice recognition stuff is actually quite ambitious, because I need to be able, I need to, be able to install a PBX, a private branch exchange, on the, on, the on, the, on the Raspberry Pi, and then I also need to be able to manage voice recognition. At this point, the number of options there are for how to do this just explode. There's not that many different private branch exchanges that you, can, that you can install on the Raspberry Pi. It's basically something called Asterisk. But Asterisk comes in a number of variations. And it's, although it advertises itself as, a, as an open source, and it is, it's, it's maintained by a commercial firm, which means to make a lot of money out of it, and does. So uh, the way that they do that is by... Well, the, do the documentation is, like, not great, and... The, and the, uh, for, they really push something called free PBX, which I would recommend you uh, to review carefully before you decide to use it. It looks really good because it's a, because it's a, um, uh, a, a GUI front-end manager for Asterisk. But what you find when you, once you've installed it is that many of the administration modules are commercial and they cost quite a lot of money. So, and, and also, Asterisk has been around for a while and it's under frantic development, so there are very many different versions. And all the components are compatible with different versions of it. So actually fitting the thing together is more, it's just a practical problem, which is a bit, which is a bit tough. So what I did, uh, oh, and of course one of the components that I'm going to need is going to be some way of getting in from the, pri from the public switch network. Because I'm going to do all the demonstrations here on a soft phone. That's a little application on the, on, on the Mac which actually behaves like, uh, like a, an internal phone to the system. But that's obviously not going to be any better for my delivery man than uh, standing outside in the rain. So, so in the end, we have to get in from the public uh, switch network as well. 
So here we go. I'm going to install asterisk. I'm not going to use free PBX. That's to say, I'm not going to use it the second time because I did try it. And then I wiped my card and I started again because it was really not going to work. Ma the, the management modules are commercials, a lot of problems. There's a Debian package for asterisk, but unfortunately, older asterisk versions, which is, it installs, I think, version 11. I think it's version 11 because the version numbering has changed. But now, uh, but now we're up to 13, and if you, want to, if you want to use some of the modules that I'm going to be talking about later on, you need the latest version. So you're going to have to install it from source, which is actually uh, not really very much worse than you would expect. Once you can find the right source, because even that, you'd think that this was, this was um, not, not an illogical place to look. But I have to say, this wasn't the first place I looked either from, uh, from looking on the, on the web. But once you've done that, then, then everything here is a kind of fairly standard, uh, fairly standard installation. So now I've got Asterisk on my phone. And Asterisk is driven sorry, on, my, on my Pi. And Asterisk is driven by something called a dial plan. Oh, I'm, I don't want to go on to that yet. First of all, I want to show that I can actually contact as Asterisk. So demo two. Let's go. So, <clears throat> um, right, so I am going to, uh, I need to... I need to do a little preliminary here, because Asterisk, when it starts up on the Pi, isn't quite what I want, so I need to, so I need to kill it. For, so what I'm going to do for that is, and this window here, I'm going to connect to it, uh, and then I'm going to uh, shut it down properly. Ah. Oh, um, oh, I'm on the wrong. Um, it'd be an idea to be on the right host, wouldn't it? Let's get to the Pi. Pseudo. Yeah. And let's start asterisk up. Or, uh, I want to connect to the running asterisk, first of all. Asterisk. That's VVVC. R. R to connect to it, and then I'm going to shut it down. I should have done this before, before I started, of course. Core stop now. And now I'm going to start it again, and it's going to start with the options I want. So now I've got asterisk running. And what I want to do is to connect to it. As you can see, it does, it does, a, little bit of work to, it does a little bit of work to start. <coughs> OK, now here's my, um, let me start up my soft phone app. This is Zoipa, which is, which is great, except for one problem. After you've made the first call with Zoipa, you don't get any voice output from it at all. And it, again, as far as I can make out, ever. So you just have to, just have to restart it over and over again. Or watch the output from, from Asterisk. So um, I'm gonna, I want to add a new contact to... Um, to this. And a, a contact in, it, this, this really confusing um, uh, terminology. Uh, where is I, I would be wanting to say, oh, new, new contacts. How do I add a new contact? This is fairly hopeless. Contacts, add. Is there an add? Ah, there's an add. Thank you. It's not like it's not like I'm worried about this 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 talk. Uh, and I'm going to add an, I'm going to add a, a a new contact, and I'll call it um, DevOps demo. And actually, all I really need to do is just say. What the extent, what extension it's going to use, what extension it's going to be calling from, I should say, which I'm going to make a hundred, and you'll see why in a moment, and what account it's going to use. And I've got a couple of accounts set up, so these want, these accounts are set up for Zoipa as a whole, and I'm hoping that one of these will work. I think the Pi is on, the Pi is actually on, on this, um, on, on that address at the moment. So I set that up, uh, and now I need to go to. Um, and now I need to go to one of the configuration files for asterisk and check that um, uh, that, that uh, the uh, the, the, the exchange is expecting to hear from this, from the user I just installed and that um, and that it's going to deal with it correctly. So let me am I logged in? I'm logged in. Um, let me just check that I, that I've got the IP address right. Looks good. Okay, so I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go to the place where Asterisk keeps everything. And I'm going to take a look at a, a file called sip.conf, 
because SIP is the session initiation protocol, which is used for, uh, which is, uh, for voice over IP, is the main way, it's a, it's a protocol, which is a, an application level protocol, like FTP or whatever, and, um, and, it's the, uh, and, and it's the main way in which voice over IP works. So I see that I actually didn't set that right, because the, the um, uh, hmm, Okay, so it looks like I maybe have I missed out. Uh, I, I, the, anybody calling into the account one is going to go to a context called Open Sesame, which is, which is obviously going to, going to run my. Ah, oh, that's right. It's going to run my uh, my, my my door opening program, and the, and there's and the secret has to be that's the password has to be change me please. And I didn't put that in for the new user, so that isn't going to work. Let me go back to let me go just copy that and paste it into the password for for that user. Oh, okay. Right. One more time. Okay. So go back to Zoipa and the DevOps demo user, and I go to more and edit it and uh, take the phone number. And there's there was a password. Sure, there's a password here, isn't there? Uh, have I imagined this? Hmm. There's a password, surely. Oh, okay. I didn't remember that. Um, that's it. So we may we may we may be in trouble here. Um, what would that be? What do I have to think of it? Is it wherever you've configured your account? You do wonder, don't you? There we go. That's right. It is. So there you are. There's the password. It was already there. Thank you. It's th this is for the this is for the. Um, uh, it's actually. I need to check that it's right for that one. I could. I, I, that'll that'll work okay because this is the password that's used for that account. Rather than, rather than for the rather than for the rather than for the particular user, so the user you have different extensions coming in for the same account. You guys are nodding your head like you know about asterisk already. I see. Okay. Well. Right. So now I should be able to uh, now if I want to know what's actually going to happen when um, when this this user calls in, I need to see what what is the the asterisk thinks it's going to do with a call to extension one uh, from extension one hundred. So let me have a look at a file called um, extensions.conf, which is where the so-called dial plan is stored. <clears throat> and here, well, you remember that the context um, that, that, that specified this user was going to go to the context called. Open Sesame, so it's all organised in these these contexts, and you can see the kind of sophistication of the of the syntax that Astris uh, typically uses. This this Open Sesame one is the place that it's going to go to for the, um, for, the for the dial plan, and it, and here's the uh, the 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 fine um, syntax that's used for the that's used to code a dial plan in Asterisk. It says if the extension is 100, then the first step is I want to answer the phone, and if and then the second step is I'm going to run that um, I'm going to run that uh, thing to 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 beep the to beep the beep the buzzer. And I'm going to do it twice here, and then that's the third one. So we'll hope that's going to work. The third one is going to hang up. So that might work. You never know. If I'll try, I'll try dialing this and see what happens. Astounding. <laughs> okay, so and, and here and here you saw that here you saw that we received the call and, and we did this. So that's um, so at least now I know I can do something um, from from within asterisk, but it's not uh, it's not an ideal situation because the uh, the syntax of the dial plan is so awful that you'd really rather do something different than. Um, uh, than, than live with it. Here's, here's, here's what the dial plan is going to be. It's not really very complicated. In fact, I've, I, may have, um, I, I, I made it a bit more complicated than this. I'll show you the real dial plan in a little while. But, um, but the basic idea is I'm, I'm going to answer the phone. I'm going to, prompt for the, I'm going to give a voice prompt for the, for the entry code. And while there's no valid code is received, I want to record the voice input from the, from the delivery person, convert it to a recognisable format. That step has to be in there because, unfortunately, um, this, the voice recognition service I'm using 
won't recognise the, the native formats that Asterisk will record in. So I have to do some conversion. Then I attempt voice recognition. I'm going to send it out to a voice recognition service. And if the recognition is unsuccessful, or it comes back recognised but the code isn't right, then I, then I output a prompt to try again. I, I made it a bit more complicated because I thought, well, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to give different voice messages for these two different conditions, but it probably wasn't really necessary. And we keep on doing this until either they get fed up or, uh, and, or hang up. I haven't got any timeouts in here, though that might be a good idea. There might be, you might put a limit on the number of times they could do this. And then if, if, we, if we actually manage to get through, we'll uh, op open the door and hang up. <coughs> So that's the idea of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the plan. But we're clearly not going to get anywhere unless we can um, do the voice recognition. So that's the next thing we have to think about. What are the options for voice recognition? Well, you can either be offline or you can be online. So there's, uh, there are offline solutions. Um, I, I didn't try them. So I'm not sure that was, uh, that was sensible not to try them, because I think, uh, I mean, you read, I've read blog posts that suggested that, um, that Sphinx, CMU Sphinx, which is like the, the state-of-the-art open source voice recognition system, I read that it didn't work very well on the Raspberry Pi, that it was slow and that it, took up a lot of, that it took up a lot of memory. But I'm not sure that was the right decision. The, the a problem about it is, it's pretty heavyweight, it takes a lot of configuration, and I wanted something simple, because you can, I think you can tell where, where I am with this kind of stuff. <coughs> uh, and you need, to create a, you need to create this pronunciation dictionary and language model and so forth. So there are other, um, there are other offline solutions. Asterisk um, has a built-in speech recognition module, but you have to pay for it, of course. Because this is how the this is how the commercial sponsors um, make their money. So I also looked at on. I'm sure there are others as well, but I didn't look further at that. There are online versions. So almost everybody uses or used to use the Google Voice APIs. I tried this and I didn't. I was completely unsatisfied with it because there's no do, there was no documentation at the time. In March they published something. They announced something called the Google Cloud Speech API, which is currently free for developers on a beta program, but will not be free indefinitely. Uh, it came too late for me to take any advantage of it because I'd, I'd got fed up with, tr with just trying things at random uh, for the, uh, because there was no documentation. But something that was pretty well documented is IBM's Watson service, which actually is pretty good. Um, as, well, I think it's pretty good. And that's the, that, that's the one that I'm using. There are no doubt many other options, but, th but this, is, this is what I went through. So now what I want to do is, I've, I've kind of got the components of what I want, I think. You know, if I can, uh, you, could, you saw what the idea of the dial plan was. This missing step there, the big missing step was the voice recognition. So now I want to implement the dial plan. Asterisk contains everything you need. You could do it all in the, um, you could do it all without going outside of the dial plan. But it's a really complicated system. It's really big. The learning curve is steep and long. Products, some products aren't free. The documentation isn't great. There are a lot of different versions, and it's very hard to tell which version, which uh, I found it. Sorry, I should aim my, my, my... I don't know whether it's just my incompetence, but you guys, if you guys have used this stuff, maybe you can confirm or otherwise what I found, which was that it's the documentation, of which there's a lot, including books, it's all different for different versions, and, the, and they didn't develop in a backward compatible way. And the dial plan scripting language is just awful. I mean, that's, 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 kind of, that's the, the nicest thing I can say about it. So the alternative is, and I think probably a lot of people do this, is to use another language. So they have this thing called, and this should, if you have a long memory, then this should warn you straight away what, what kind of land you're in. They have something called the asterisk gateway in interface, which, is, um, which obviously is a rip-off of the common gateway interface, which was like a prehistoric way of running, of running programs from, uh, from web pages, and that, from web servers, and actually required you to start a new process for every single request. And that is actually the case with uh, AGI, but fast AGI is slightly better because you run a service, you, you, run a, you, set up a, 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 you set a service running, and then you send, uh, and then you send TCP requests to it. So that's, that's the way we're going to go. Uh, there are lots of um, libraries for, for, for the fast AGI and AGI, but obviously the one I chose was Java because that's all I know really. So I wanted to use Groovy. Because uh, it's actually, and that was actually a good choice because it, what it means is you don't have to recompile it all the time, um, and you and you don't really want a development environment on the on the Pi. So. Um, First of all, you've got to install Asterisk Java, which is a Java library, for obviously, for Asterisk. Um, that's OK, but I'm not sure the version is quite right. I haven't had any trouble with it, but it's, but it's, not, it's not up to date with the, with the version of Asterisk that I had to choose in order to get the, the modules that I wanted later on. 
It, Asterisk Java only supports fast AGI. So you've got to do this rather complicated thing of dispatching every request from, uh, from the dial plan. It, there's a complicated process of uh, dispatch, which I'll show you in a moment, to, to send it to the freestanding server. Actually, getting the freestanding server working is just, is just a matter of starting up a process. So you do that, and this will then listen on port 4573 by default, and, and you then install Groovy, which was actually relatively easy, and you're kind of ready to go. Oh, I've got to do a demo. I'm, I'm supposed to do a demo. Um, right, I want, to, I want to show that I can get Groovy to work, but I'm kind of short of time, so well, let's try it. Um, what am I going to do? Uh, demo three. Well, I, yeah, I, let, let's, get, let's get Groovy to work. Um, so, so to show that this, this really does go. Um, right. So I need to start up if, for that. Oh, right. What I'm going to do for that is um, I, want, I want this. I seem to have, I seem to have deleted my, uh, the, one, of the, one of the dial plans I, I needed. So let me just reproduce it. Oh, this looks like it, actually. Um, no, no. What I want is... Um, this one, isn't it? It's this one. This is, this is the one I want. So I've got to get this to work. We've already seen it working, haven't we? Um, it, that went to that one. Uh, no, sorry, wrong one. Wrong one. We, didn't, we haven't used that one. We've only used this one. And what I want to do here, let me just work it out, is I want to... Um, I'm going to use AGI. I can't remember what I meant to do with this demo. Oh, I know, I know. It's just, I'm just going to run it from. I'm just going to run it from the command line. I'm just going to run from the command line. That was the idea. Sorry. So I need to have a um, uh, a, a groovy file. That uh, I need to have a groovy um, a script that's going to. I need to have a groovy script that's going to. That's going to call the the my GPIO program. I'm sorry for the hesitation. So uh, say vi groovy. Well, let, let, me, let me just see where I, what I, if I've got anything in my um, uh, Groovy library, my library of Groovy scripts. It's not very extensive. <laughs> no. So I'll say vi um, pi slash groovy, groovy slash, what do I call it? Um, run GPIO example. Run GPIO example dot, dot groovy. And all I need to do in this is simply to call my, if it, provided, of course, I can get the, um, this class path set up correctly, uh, my, my GPIO example, which is the, which is the name of the, um, the Java class. And this time, we can have, I can get, have a choice of the number of, the number of beeps. How many would you like? Nobody's volunteering. Two again. No, I want, to, I want so, I mean, I have to have something different. <laughs> we haven't got time. <laughs> five, all right then, five. We've just about got time for five. I, I, know, I know, you guys want to get away for your, um, for your beer. Right, so, um, let's, let's, so I should be able, I think, to say um, uh, groovy... I hope, I hope this is going to work. The CP... Looks good. Um, dot colon uh, lib slash star, and I think I'm going to need the. I'm going to need the. No, that's fine. Uh, pi groovy groovy uh, run GPIO example. Right. Okay. So maybe that'll work. Mm, look good. Good. Okay, so Groovy. So I actually can. I can. I can make it. I can make it go from gro from Groovy. So that's good. Obviously, we're not. We're far from there yet, but we're getting there. Um, so now, what I want to do is, I want to run. I want to run that Groovy script, or not that Groovy script, but a Groovy script. I want to run it from AGI. Now, and, and I said I would. I promised I would explain to you. 
It's, not, it's more, a threat, more a threat than a promise, how fast AGI works. So I'm going to have, in my, um, in my dial plan, I'm going to have a line like this. It's going to say, oh yeah, I have to tell you, one of the books about, uh, about asterisk says proudly, look, we don't have to write X10 arrow 100. They said, in the never-ending, the never-ceasing quest for coding simplicity, they said, we've introduced this abbreviation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so, here, so here's an, a fast AGI request, and the way, this, w w the way it works is that this will go to the, the server that's been set up. It's, um, by default, it'll go to port 4573. Four, four, the server goes and looks in, a, in, a, in a, a properties file, which has to be on the class path, and it, and it contains literally that text to tell you that, this is, that when run GPIO example.groovy, uh, is, the, is the request from the, from the uh, dial plan, then it, it's got to be sent to the Groovy AGI script. Everything, by the way, is always sent to the Groovy. All Groovy things are going, to be, are going to be mapped to the Groovy AGI script. Because what happens is it sends the AGI request, which is roughly speaking information the client gives, and the AGI channel, which is the call, it corresponds to the connection that you've got. And it sends that to the Groovy AGI script, which I'll show you in a moment, and that then um, the Groovy AGI script then dispatches that. It's a, it's a script engine, basically, which dispatches that to the, to the right place. Um, so, uh, so let's have a look at the, uh, Let's just quickly have a look at the, uh, a, the Groovy AGI script just to see what's going on there. <coughs> so I think it's probably here. Is that right? Yeah. So I think I... Oh, I know what I can do. I can do that. So it doesn't do anything very complicated, um, though I could not have figured it out for myself. You, all this stuff is kind of uh, is is um, gathered gathered from the internet. Basically, basically, the service request comes in from the from Fast AGI, and it contains the request in the channel. And the idea is that what it's going to do is it's going to bind. It's going to create a new binding. And it's going to set request variable to the received request and the channel variable to the channel request. So these are now going to be accessible from inside of the Groovy script. And you can now use the asterisk Java library for getting at them. OK, and then, and then, it, then it just uses a Groovy scripting engine, which it gets, which it, uh, in, gets at initialization time, and, and runs, it, runs it supplying this binding, which is a set of variables that have been mapped to these things. And, and that kind of works. That works. So, um, so let's see whether we can get this to work. I'm pushing it on the time. I had no idea how long this talk would take. It didn't seem to me there was anything in it. Uh, might be worthwhile getting into the pie. Okay, so I'm, I'm now in the bottom left window, and I've just started the, the I've just started the server. So it's listening on four five seven three, and uh, I should be able to. Here's here's the dial plan, and the dial plan now says that if I that if I um, uh, go to open sesame. Well, this is uh, this one. Uh, I need I need a new dial. Is that right? I need a new dial plan. I think. Um, Keep an example from asterisk. Uh, no, I think we're ready to go, actually. Um, I would like to... Hmm, I think what I want to do is to run what I just did from inside of the... Um, from inside of the dial plan, which was, what did I do? I ran GPIO. I want to send to the, uh, I, need, I need an AGI thing, and I want, what I want is that one. It's something like that. But so I'm going to say, um, AGI colon localhost uh, slash run GPIO example, run GPIO example dot groovy. I think that should work, and that should just do the same thing as we did as we did running directly. I think I have to remember to reload the dial plan. So I've done that, and now we're still because I edited this. I should just be able to dial the same number again and get the, and get that to work. So it should go five times again, maybe. 
uh, it's complaining. Run GPIO example dot groovy not found. That's not right. Do you need to change that to AGI? Uh, I do need to. Thank you very much. I do. That will definitely help. Oh, not like that though. Right, does that look right? I always end up with a lot of audience participation in my my demos. Let's try that again. Reload demo. Uh, dial plan reload. Uh, dial plan reload. Right, let's have another go. Good. Okay, so you can you can actually see down here that the, 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 it's that it's working. Good. Whew. Right. So now we've got everything. I think we're pretty much there, ish. Uh, modulo some things that need to, need. To. So I'm gonna I'm gonna comment this out. As you can see, I've got the I've got the the real thing ready. I'm gonna so I'm gonna comment this 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 one out. And. What I'm going to do now is the same as what I just did, except I'm going to execute a different. Um, uh, I'm going to execute a different Groovy script. So, so I, I, the components are all are all just the same. I'll say dial plan. You didn't, then, you didn't then I didn't uncomment it. Thank you very much. You can see where I got my reputation for demos from. All right. Okay. So now, of course, I'll. Need to remember to reload the dial plan again. So I think this should all work. Is that right? Do we think that? We have no idea, do we? Um, okay. So I want to. I'm going to now. Let's go here and take a take a look at the um, the actual di the real di the real dial plan in in Groovy. That is, pi slash Groovy. Slash um, what I what I call it open sesame open sesame dot groovy so here it is and I'll close this window um, because it, because we want to see what's going on 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 the server at the same time as here so this is what it looks like in groovy this is this is this is the whole thing so now I'm oh and by the way probably what I should also have done um, what's the name of the what's the name of the file let me just see where somewhere there's a dummy a home pi dummy codes db so let's just take a quick look at that. Um, hold on, and I'll just uh, I'll just quit this because I just want I just want to show you what's in there. Uh, what was it? Um, I've already I've already forgotten. So, uh, I've, I've, oh, sorry, say again. Uh, dummy code, thank you. Right, okay. So it just contains this. That's the, that's the total validation that we've got there. Two, one, three, four, six. I have to remember that. It's really important because otherwise I can't say the right thing. Right, so let's, let's uh, try it and see what happens. Two, one, three, four, six. Two, one, three, four, six. Two, one, three, four, six. Please say your entry code now. Two, two one, three, four, six. Oh. Converting audio format, so it's converting it. Right, we should be following it in here, but of course we don't have time to do that really. Sending it for speech recognition, it's so exciting. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Please repeat it. <laughs> Two, one, three, four, six. What did, we, what did it actually get? We don't see what it, what it, what it gave us here. Bloody should have, should have done. That's funny. Oh, it's because I've turned the I've, I've turned the um, the logging down because I thought we were getting too much noise, and I'm still talking. That's really the problem. It, it's waiting for a pause. Go on, go on, get on with it. Oh, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna hang this one up and start again. Ah, just too late. Right, okay, right. Let's have another go. Two, one, three, four, six. <laughs> Why is the matter with you? 
2, 1, 3, 4, 6. You notice the one time it did recognise it, I was out of kilter with, with it. So that's really irritating. Oh, I, don't, I don't know what's the matter with it. It's, 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 got itself in, it's got itself into a state. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hang this up. Uh, I'm it's saying time's up, so what, I, so what I really want to do is show you that... And we're still, unfortunately, inside of the, inside of the flat, aren't we? So, in the, in, the, in the remaining minus 30 seconds that I've got, I'm going to kill this now, because I think it maybe has got into its, itself into a state, um, and start it again. And I'm going to pull my secret weapon out of the box here, which is that. It's an, old, uh, it's an old dongle I had lying around. I'm going to insert this into there. And of course, I, of course, I should have... I need to... Um, I made a mistake to, to start it before that. And I've also need to just move the... Um, uh, I need to... Uh, I, I kept the, the, the dongle module. I kept it out, I kept it out of the um, asterisk directory. Uh, because it would have interfered with things. So we'll just move that in now. Restart asterisk. And who knows? <coughs> right. You're still going to need to work. City and phone. Recent. Two, one, three, four, six. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're out of luck here. Two, one, three. All those chickens I sacrificed to the demo gods, and not one of them has <laughs> worked. Bah. Okay, all right. I, I'm going I'm I'm to give up on this. Pun? He wrote a letter to run the ball. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, hang, I'll hang this call up. It really does work quite a lot of the time. Obviously, obviously, the demo gods weren't with me today. So anyway, let's just uh, get to the um, let's just get to the, the real point of the whole thing, which is this. <laughs> okay, so the, so the credits for the, uh, for the film are actually much more important than the credits for the talk. <laughs> and I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. I'm sorry about that. Um, but obviously, I'm very happy to talk to anybody about it afterwards. I'm really sorry that the demos didn't work, because it would have been quite satisfying. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I can't, I'm, I'm afraid... It, well, actually, if you want to stay, you can ask questions. If, if you want to stay. If, if, nobody, if nobody comes into the room. I, I mean, I don't know if anybody has got any questions about that. Yes? the hardware dongle? The hardware dongle, it's an old... Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. A Huey um, something or other. Um, so the, the, there are about a million of these kinds. This is the most common kind there is. I just got it from O2 a million years ago. As a, it was going to be a USB modem for my machine. That was just lying around the place. I went and got a data card from O2. You have to have a data card for it. And the stuff you have to do, which was on the slide there, about it's a whole other world you've got to get into about, um, about configuring the dongle because these things are set up... Um, these things are set up to act like flash storage, and you've got to, you've got to switch the mode over. Unix people know all about this stuff. Uh, and you've got to disable the pin code if it was enabled. But it's a bog-standard piece of hardware. These, these things, uh, however you pronounce that, 
that one, that word there. Most of the dongles you're going to get in the shops are like that. And, and Chan dongle, which is the module for, uh, for asterisk, is angled towards this. But to find the right version of that that doesn't have bugs in for the latest version of asterisk is, a, is a, one of these hunts you have to do through Google. But uh, you, get, you get there in the end. The only thing that the only thing that I had to, the, the only configuration of the dongle that you've got to do. I did a lot of stuff to try to improve the quality. There's a thing called a, a jitter buffer, which the idea of that is to try to smooth out, um, uh, to try and smooth out uh, voice over IP. There's, there's big problems with quality, and tracking them down is quite hard. So the jitter buffer is designed is designed to prevent. Um, uh, packets from building up and uh, sort of fluctuations in the speed of the traffic. I'm not explaining that very well. But I, I did fiddle with that, but I'm not sure that it, that it did any good. I've usually got much better results than you've seen in this demo. The one thing that you've got to do, which I maybe should have showed you, is dongle.conf has to say what the context is going to be. You might have noticed in the extensions, uh, in the dial plan, that there was a context called dongle.conf, which did exactly the same thing as I was doing for, for the internal call. I don't know what you'd get now. This one's very old. Uh, just to get it straight, when you were calling for your, from your mobile phone, you were calling like uh, a cell phone number? I was calling, yeah, I was calling, I was calling, the, I was calling the, num the number of the SIM card in here. Yes, yes, that's right. So have you heard about like, those um, uh, uh, phone APIs like Twilio or something? Because Twilio is like a, a service that does all of this without all of those well, that, 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 would be, that would be an interesting thing to try. I'm not sure how it worked with my problem. The reason I didn't... I mean, what most people would do is they'd use, they'd use something called a SIP gateway, which takes um, calls from the... Um, which, takes, uh, which, which is a gateway, obviously, between the public switch network and the, int and the internet. And it takes and it, and it will take you taken out um, an external call and pass it in. I can't. This won't work for me because I'm on the because I use the university's Wi-Fi and I can't I can't configure the router firewall. SIP is a very SIP is a peculiar protocol because it doesn't. I mean, I I, I use tunneling to get out. There's, I have a service. You know. You know. I, I guess most people know how tunneling works, but. But it, it, SIP is different because it uses a different port for the ringtone from what it does for the subsequent voice traffic. So uh, I have no idea whether I can use tunneling with it, and I, had, and I kind of gave up trying that and went, went over to the dongle. You see, there's a load of choices you have to make all the time in this, in this thing. It's always, I mean, there's lots of different possibilities all the time. You could probably make any of them work if you had infinite time. But the, pr the problem is finding your way through this, th through this maze uh, you know, while, you know, before your hair turns grey. Oh, that didn't work very well. <laughs> OK, thank you very much.